Hello everybody, last year I was lucky enough to attend the launch of the brand new Ferrari Roma over in Italy. Now cynics might call that car simply a Portofino Coupe, but in truth it is a very different animal. The exterior styling is totally different and very new for Ferrari. The interior has technology and layout derived from the all new SF90 and there were some key changes made to the car's dynamics in order to make it appeal more to enthusiast drivers. The Portofino though hasn't been left to languish in its brother's shadow because now we have this, the Portofino M. M stands for Modificata and it's a designation that Ferrari have used fairly sparingly over the last few decades on cars like the F512M, the 575M and the 456M. It's for cars where they've made some significant mechanical changes but not enough to really call it a whole new model. How can you spot a Portofino M over the regular car? Well, the easiest way is from the front, where you'll find these little vents here in the bumper and a much more aggressive treatment here. Bigger intakes and a bit of a sort of squared off look at the front. The interior is a case of subtle evolution rather than revolution. And if you had a regular Portofino, I think you'd struggle to see where the changes have been made. Perhaps the most significant though is here where the little Manatina has now gained two extra settings, giving it the five you'd get on the rest of the Ferrari lineup. The extra modes here are wet, which I don't think many people will use, and race, which I think you will. You see, before you simply had comfort, sport, and ESC off. I don't think many people are gonna to wanna to turn the traction control off on their car, but they'd like a sort of halfway mode, and that's exactly what race is. It's what Ferrari call maximum fun to drive those Italians. Up front, nestled way behind the front axle line, you will find the familiar 3.9 litre twin turbocharged V8, which has received the same upgrade pack as in the Roma. Peak power is now 620 horses, with torque 760 newton metres, that's about 560 pound foot. Now that extra grunt has come from revised cams, new springs, new valves, which are all lighter and very trick, and a new exhaust. Ferrari have also put in a turbo speed sensor, which means the turbo can rev harder and for longer safely, which helps make more power and make the car more exciting to drive when you're in the upper reaches of the rev range. The exhaust in particular is worth talking about because Ferrari have had to put in, like many other manufacturers, particulate filters. This has actually robbed the car of about 22 horsepower. So the changes they made should normally have given them another 42 brake, but here it's got only about 20 more. Still, 620 horsepower should be enough to make this an exciting drive. The car has also received what is for me one of the best bits of the Roma, which is Ferrari's new eight-speed gearbox. It is a technological tour de force. Whenever you do a Ferrari press launch, you're always given lots and lots of technical information, and they will happily tell you that the new gearbox is stronger, faster, lighter, and bizarrely, even more compact than the old seven-speed it replaces, thanks to the fitment of a dry sump system. Now, very often you see these sorts of things written down and you find that they don't really translate to a real world benefit, especially when the old seven speeder was quite so good. But I can tell you that the new eight really is a marked improvement over the old one and it's easily one of the best gearboxes I have ever used. There are some other new features you can have with the Portofino M2 as well, including these new forged wheels and an air scarf available at a rather reasonable, for Ferrari standards, £2,000. You can even get Android Auto along with Apple CarPlay. Prices start at about 175,000. This being a press car is gonna be very expensive, but in the real world, I'd say you'd be specking these cars to between 200 and 210. Now, in theory, we should be in Italy right about now. However, because of travel restrictions, we've got the next best thing. Swindon. So, can we find, on a very grey day, somewhere around here that'll allow the Portofino M to shine, and most importantly, if you've already got a regular Portofino or a California T, are the changes enough to make this car worthwhile? Let's find out. Now, it probably comes as no surprise that the Portofino M isn't dramatically different to the original Portofino. And if you have driven that car and weren't very impressed by it, I'd say this is unlikely to change your mind. It is just a little bit better in a few quite subtle ways. The last time I drove a Portofino was unfortunately in the middle of winter, on winter tyres, and it was extremely cold. So I don't think I can really give any sort of definitive dynamic comparisons. However, I can tell you that this car definitely feels 
quite a bit quicker. This is definitely a fast car, and that's not something you'd really say about some of the previous Ferrari convertibles. The California, certainly brisk, but not really super fast. And the Cali T was the weirdest of them all, because that just didn't really seem to have the punch you'd expect from a turbocharged engine with the kind of numbers it was producing. This, though, really does feel like the full 560 pound foot are present and correct. As you've probably also noticed, I am on the wrong side of the car because this is one of the press vehicles which was supposed to be on the launch in Italy. It's already done the rounds in much of Europe and there are a few little things that we have noticed which I'm going to put down to this being a pre-production vehicle. Some seat creaking, some panel alignment, that sort of stuff. I did try and test the Android Auto in this car but unfortunately I didn't have very much luck. It would work for about sort of 30 seconds and then cut out and take another minute or two before it tried again. So I don't know whether that's again a pre-production issue or the fact I've got a brand new USB cable. I don't think it's a car specific issue. My phone has been playing up so I'm not really going to mark this down for that. Many of the Portofino's, shall we call them, quirks are also present and correct here. The one today that got us in trouble was the fact that when you do open the roof, it opens the boot at the same time. So we were going up a hill, put the roof down, and I dropped all my detailing products out the back of the car. So travelling bowling ball salespeople probably shouldn't buy a Portofino M. Like every Mercedes I've ever tried, the Ferrari air scarf just didn't work for me. It was positioned too low down to be effective, though others said they had no problems with it. But I'd personally say you'd be better off specifying the heated and ventilated seats instead. Those I find much more effective in both summer and winter. The reality though is that most people buying one of these cars are probably doing so for leisure or as a, a really nice, you know, summer daily. And for that, it does the job quite well. It's extremely comfortable to the extent that I've been driving it for most of this review in the stiff suspension mode and it's it's a good car. It's quiet, it's refined. At 70 mile an hour on the motorway you can have a conversation with whoever you've got in the passenger seat. The rear space is quite limited. The seats are as optimistic as they've ever been, but the boot is, is an alright size for this segment. experimented a little bit with both sport and race mode. In some of the other Ferraris that I've driven recently, the 812 GTS, the F8 Spider, it makes a really big difference to the character of the car. The change in the Portofino is quite a bit more subtle. It's also worth explaining how the ESC off mode works, because that again isn't quite the same as the CT and CST off buttons you'll get in some of the other cars. Now when you put ESC off, the stability and traction control are off. However, under braking, stability control is active once again. And that, I think, is a good way to have it, because if you are braking hard, that means you might be out of control, and that's when you want traction control to be doing its thing. Nipping past cars, trying to do half the speed limit, is very easy. This engine and gearbox, as ever, are the stars of the show. It sounds pretty decent too. Okay, no, it's not a raucous screamer and it doesn't even sound as good as the original California, but it makes a, a pleasant sound. And you can drive this car more or less however you like. If you want to drive it off the mid-range and have that turbocharged torque just shift you along, easily done. This corner might be familiar to a few people, not viewers of my channel, and another well-known, slightly older gentleman does use this road on occasion. Or, if you want to rev it out, you really do feel the benefits. Response is just sensational, and this gearbox is truly amazing. In auto mode, it does have a propensity, like all of these things, just to try and get into top gear as quickly as it can. However, if you do that, and you then want to make a quick pass, it's very well set up. I've found a lot of these can really get a little bit flummoxed when you want to then sort of make a, a quick overtake or something. This does not. Allow me to demonstrate. So I'm going to put the car in auto mode. I'm going to slow down to about sort of 40 mile an hour or so. I'm going to give it a moment just to change up a few cogs because it will. And there's eighth. The car is doing 1,000 RPM. 
We're doing 40 mile an hour. Let's pretend we want to overtake. So I'm going to go, oh, there's my overtaking spot. Foot down. There's the power, straight into third gear. No indecisiveness, nothing. This car knew exactly what it wanted to do and did it straight away. Very impressive. Now it is a wide old thing. It's not the easiest thing to place, but I'm gonna put that down to the fact that I am on the wrong side of the car. One thing that Darren, my co-pilot, and I have noticed with this car is when we're doing manoeuvres, putting into reverse, then back into gear, isn't always the swiftest. It's not horrendous, but you do need to be a little bit more stationary than you sometimes want to be. Darren, my co-pilot, has actually given me an interesting little bit of feedback because he's sort of my outsider. He knows performance cars and he's driven a lot of stuff, but his only Ferrari driving experience to date has been in my car. So he's used to the older generation. He hasn't been in anything this new. And what he said about it was that he felt it just a little bit unsettled. And I, I do see what he means, because on roads like this, the way Italians generally tend to set up their cars with a lot of toe out, means that it, it does wander just a touch. It's okay if you're in the mood for it, but a casual driver might find it a touch tiring. If that's the case, something like a Merc SL63 is probably going to be a little bit more appropriate. There's certainly no doubting the pace of the thing, though. ground quickly there are worse ways to do it than in a Portofino M that little section there though the car did get very squirrely and started moving a lot more than I hoped it would when you're taking up this much of the road as well can be a little bit disconcerting the gearbox really is sensational but sadly the steering continues to be a bit of a weak point in this car as are the brakes. As you begin to press on, the brakes become less of an issue, but the steering, unfortunately, never really ascends to the greatness that you expect from it. It's a fairly light rack in the Ferrari tradition, but you do get a little bit of feel, a little bit of texture, and a little bit of weighting through it, but never quite enough. You hop into something like an F8, and you just get absolutely instant confidence to be the most awful hooligan behind the wheel of that car. It's absolutely sensational. This is just always a little bit aloof, a little bit distant, and that means when you then get to the sort of eight, nine tenths kind of stages, you don't have that confidence to really take the car to the next level. And that's a shame because I do believe that the chassis is very capable of going there. Traction control, as ever, really very good. And that seems to be the biggest difference here with race mode. With most of the cars, that's kind of the main changes are in how the traction works. In an F8 and an 812, night and day difference. Here, it's pretty subtle. The Portofino has just that little bit less power and I would say probably a, a reasonable amount of grip compared to those two cars. Even in sport mode, the car will get quite squirrely. Race mode just seems to let it get a little bit more. That's really the difference. Race mode in an F8 completely changes the car. It hops and skips and, and bounces around. I think with time, it's fair to say I might find a few more differences, some subtle nuances with race mode. But in the sort of couple of hours I've had to drive the car today, I haven't really found much benefit by being in it. Gear shifts again are something where in the F8 and the 812, very different between race mode and sport. Here, they're always pretty much the same. They are perfectly judged for this kind of car. I wouldn't want the Portofino to shift in the same brutal way that an A12 does in race mode. It wouldn't be right for this kind of car. You may have noticed we've got the wind deflector up and that is an absolute essential, by the way. If you're gonna have the roof down, do it. We've traveled a little bit with the roof up and I have to say it's a very, very nice place to be. It feels just like a coupe. And this is maybe one of the few cars where I'll actually say that it really does look just as good roof up as it does roof down. <laughs> well, this thing moves around. Feels like threading a needle driving a car this big and wide down this road. The width is definitely exaggerated by the fact that I am on the wrong side of the car. I'm not even actually going as fast as I think. It's just that because I'm using all the road, you have to keep your wits about you. It's not a relaxing car to drive fast. 
However, if you back off and sort of drive this at six tenths, I don't really feel like you're losing anything from the experience either. It's very nice to just know you've always got that little bit of extra performance in reserve as and when you need it. As a car, it is very good, but should you buy one, you're gonna be looking realistically at about 200, 210,000 pounds. If you've already got a Portofino, I don't really think it's probably gonna be worth it. However, what if you've got a Cali or a Cali T? If you've got a California and you're very happy with what that car gives you, I'd say keep it. It's a fine thing, but if you feel like the pace of that car really isn't befitting the Cavallino badge on the front, this will certainly make you a very, very happy person. For the California T owner, I would also say that this car is definitely a worthy upgrade, but is it worth spending the extra on getting the M over the regular Portofino? I suppose that depends on how you're gonna use the car. If you're the kind of person that's quite happy poodling about every now and again using the performance on off from that being it, no, it's not. But if you do want the last word in dynamics, if you do want the fastest thing you can get, the Portofino M is certainly the car to have. I would go so far as to say that Ferrari's claim of only another 20 horsepower in this almost seems a little bit modest. The Roma remains a very different car. Now, I think it's got as much to do with the roads I tested it on and the, the time I had with it, but I've never felt quite as confident to play with this car like I did with the Coupe. This should be a decent enough car if you want to slide around every now and again, but I don't think I've found the roads to really experiment with that here today. Ultimately, for the purist petrol head who just wants the absolute last word in dynamic involvement and excitement, this was never the car for you. That was the F8 Spider, the upcoming 296 Spider, whenever that comes out, or indeed the 812 GTS. Those are all, I'm sure, fine cars. And equally, if you are on a budget and you want a, a fast luxury convertible, an SL63 is still a fine thing. But the Ferrari really does things just that little bit differently to everybody else. Whether it's the right car, only you can decide. But I hope today I've managed to give you, with this first drive, just a little bit of an insight into what the Portofino M is like. It is a Portofino, just a little bit more. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Oh, I do wish though they'd put a fan down here because my knees are a bit chilly again. <laughs> I need a granny blankie. Thanks all for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.